اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربی شراحلی صدری و یسر علی عمری وحل العقدتن من لسانی یفقہو قولی سورہ راد ورس 34 They shall be punished in the life of this world still more grievous is the punishment of the hereafter and there is none to protect them from Allah Now this verse is actually a continuation of the previous verse that says that such stubborn and obstinate pe- people who insist to go on the wrong path to follow the wrong path then naturally they have lost it all due to their wrong decisions they have not only become deserving of punishment in akhirah but in this dunya too verse 35 as for the paradise which the writers have been promised it is like this rivers flow beneath it eternal are its fruits and eternal are its shades such is the reward of the writers but the reward of the unbelievers is fire allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear once again in this verse that the promise of jannah is for the muttaqi the allah conscious so everyone shouldn't keep high hopes but only the muttaqi people then comes a description of jannah that streams are flowing underneath it maybe it has a transparent flooring and these streams can be seen from there and has evergreen plants and fruits in dunya every fruit comes or grows in a certain period of time in a particular season and then it just vanishes even if it is kept in the cold store it will not have the same taste but contrary to this in the akhira the plants and fruits would be evergreen and in every season and like the fruits the shade will be evergreen always this is the reward of the people of taqwa and the outcome of the kafirin is the fire of hell was 36 O Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam some of those to whom we have given the book rejoice at what is revealed to you while there are some fractions who deny a part of it tell them i am commanded to worship allah and to associate none with him to him i invite you and to him i shall return the verse says that the people who were given the book this means the people of the book the jews and the christians that they rejoice meaning that they are happy on the coming of the quran now one finds that up till now we have studied in the quran that people of the book were very prejudiced against prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and also against the quran and they had so much jealousy malice and hatred in their hearts that they always denied the quran and here it says that they rejoiced when the quran came so is it a contradiction between the verses of the quran the answer is that amongst the people of the book there were some though a very few but they had iman and when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came they welcomed him with open arms and this is not a contradiction uh, it's the state of affairs of those people who were different from the majority uh i'm trying to clarify this difference because the critics or the anti islam forces pick out such verses and quote them against the authenticity of the quran so your mind should be clear about it then after that the verse says that there are some groups who deny a part of it and accept some of it so up till now we have come across three categories of people regarding their reaction towards the quran the ones who totally deny the quran the ones who totally accept it and the ones who accept some of it and reject the rest now who are these three kinds this category belongs to the muslims because they too are people of the book like they also deny certain parts of the quran sometimes verbally sometimes practically and denial is shown in deeds that is amal and at the end of the verse prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is told to say that i worship only allah and i do not obey anyone against his command i invite the people to do the same why because the ultimate return is to him so our 
top priority should be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not others. Verse 37, with these instructions, we have revealed this commandment in Arabic language. Now, if you follow their vain desires after real knowledge has come to you, there will be none to save you or protect you against the wrath of Allah. Allah says that we sent this Quran in Arabic. Then the verse says that if you follow their vain desires. Now, who is this you over here? Who is being told that? Prophet Wasallam. And whose vain desires? The people of the book. That if you follow their vain desires after you have gained knowledge, then there would be no protector for you from Allah. Imagine that this is being said to Prophet Wasallam that even if you follow their desires, then you will not be protected against the wrath of Allah. So what lesson do we learn from this verse that every uh, that even prophet وسلم, like every other person was not allowed to follow the desires of the people so how can we hope that we spend our lives according to the desires of people and yet get salvation allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using such harsh words for his most beloved prophet and do you think he will let us get away with it? We have read in the very first juz that the people of the book will never be happy with you. And look at ourselves. We are trying to please the so-called superpowers with all our hearts. And are they pleased with us? Are they supporting us? Are they helping us? This verse is also a warning for the ulema or the scholars of deen who try to say things which would not anger or upset people. They are not ready to put at stake their own popularity. So they say things which would please people, even if it goes against Islam. Verse 38, we have sent forth other rasuls before you and given them wives and children. And it was never in the power of a rasul to show any miracle without the sanction of Allah. For such, uh, for each period, there was a book. Now, the common thinking of the disbelieving uh, people was that a prophet should be from a species other than human beings. For example, he should be an angel so that his super, uh, supremacy over the general people is proved. The Quran has refuted this concept in many verses by conveying that these people simply fail to realize the wisdom behind sending human beings like them as prophets. A prophet is a model for all human beings to follow and it is obvious that they can follow only a human being and not a supernatural being with supernatural powers. With this mentality of theirs, they objected on the marriages of Prophet wasallam. that what sort of a prophet he is who has marriages and has children. For them, it was more appropriate that a prophet should have no normal li life, but he should totally cut away from all ties of dunya. Their this objection is being answered in this verse by asking them, how can you consider a person who marries once or more than once and has a family and children as not being fit or being contrary to the station of prophethood? What proof do you have for such an assertion? In fact, the truth is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes his prophets masters of a household, prophets who have passed earlier, and you too believed in the prophethood of some of them. So why this objection on Prophet wasallam? This is not something against the norms of being a prophet or a saint, and to think that way is sheer ignorance. It says in the Sahih of Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, I too keep fast and I too break it. Meaning that I don't always keep fasting. He said, I too sleep during nights and rise up too for prayers. That is, I do not keep praying all night, but I sleep too. 
and I eat meat too and I marry too. Whoever finds this practice of mine objectionable, he is not a Muslim. Then the verse says, And it is not for a messenger to bring a sign without the will of Allah. Now the background of the revelation of this sentence is that the non-believers had always been asking these two questions to the blessed prophets and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam too was not spared of these questions number 1 that the injunctions revealed in the book of allah should be in accordance with their wishes for example in surah yunus that is chapter 10 verse 15 it says bring to us a quran other than this which does not prohibit the worship of our idols or change it that is you yourself change the injunctions brought by it replacing punishment with mercy and unlawful with the lawful and their second demand or question that despite seeing open miracles of the blessed prophets, may peace be upon them all, they still insisted that ever new miracles should be shown to them. They would say that uh, show us this miracle or that miracle, then we will consider to be a Muslim, to become a Muslim. And the word ayah used here has two meanings. One meaning is a sign which here means a miracle and the verses of the Quran are also called ayah. Therefore, in, their, in the explanation of this verse, some commentators have taken the meaning as verses of the Quran and say that no prophet has the authority to introduce a verse on his own in his book. And some commentator says, taking it in the sense of a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given any prophet the authority or the choice to show a miracle by himself. And the tafsir Ru al-Mani says that both meanings could be applied, both explanations are correct. And then we come to the end of the verse which says, لِكُلِّ أَجَلٍ kitab For every time there is something prescribed. Now the word ajal means a time frame for everything and kitab means something written or prescribed. This statement also has got two meanings. Number one, that Allah has written down the time for everything. For example, when such a such person will be born, how many days will he live, which places he shall go, what will be his life work and when will he die. And number two, that a certain set of instructions would be sent to such and such prophet and such a such time and such and such nation. Therefore, the lesson is that when these non-believers are demanding from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is a hostile and a wrong demand and it has its basis in unawareness and ignorance. Now the lesson for us in this verse is that Islam defies monasticism. In Islam, getting married is ibadah. Raising up children with good morals is ibadah and is sadaqatun jariya as well. And Islam is a balanced deen. It does not condemn your natural desires. Verse 39, Allah cancels and confirms what he pleases. With him is the master copy of the book. Now the word Ummul Kitab is translated as mother of the book. It means the original book, the preserved tablet, the Lohi Mahfuz. Leading authorities in Tafsir, Hazrat Sayyid bin Jubair and Qatada Rahim Anhu say that the meaning of this verse is that this verse is about Nasq. Now, what is nasq? Nasq means that certain injunctions and religious codes are cancelled out in the books which have been sent by Allah's uh, uh, will. And even in the Quran as well, certain verses have been cancelled out. In his great wisdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cancels or changes whichever injunctions he wills and retains whichever he wills. According to uh, the consideration of the prevailing conditions 
amongst people. The original book is with him. It is already written there that such and such injunction sent down for these people is for a particular period of time or is based on particular conditions. When that term expires, the injunctions will also change. Also written there is a description of the injunction which will replace the one changed. The second interpretation of this verse is by Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas anhu, and a group of other commentators. They say that this verse is regarding taqdeer. And the meaning of the verse has been explained by saying that according to the uh, statements of the Quran and Hadith, the destinies of the creations of Allah, including the sustenance received by every person in dunya during his entire years of life and the comfort and distress faced uh, along the line, everything is written uh, since eternity, even before the creation of his creatures. But, but for this decree of destiny, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipes off or cancels what he wills and retains what he wills. In other words, he can make any change in it. Just like us that if we write something, we can always change whichever part we want to by rubbing and writing something new. So why can't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this? This point has been elaborated in many authentic ahadis, which tells us that there are certain deeds which cause a person's age and sustenance to increase and some make them decrease. It appears in the Sahih of Bukhari that maintaining relations which must be maintained becomes the cause of increase in one's age. A narration in the Musnad of Ahmad reports that there are occasions when one commits some sin which leads to his being deprived of deprived of sustenance and by serving and obeying one's parents uh, years of your life increase and nothing except dua can avert what is divinely des destined so we find out from these narrations that taqdeer is changed by certain deeds and it also changes with the power of dua Verse 40, O Muhammad, whether we let you see within your lifetime a part of what we threaten them with or cause you to die before we smite them, your mission is only to deliver the message and it is for us to take accountability. Actually, this verse is an answer. Answer to what? The question of the non-believers that when will the azab come or why isn't the azab coming which you talk about? Prophet ﷺ is being consoled as we have said that this azab will come and so it will. Maybe it comes during your lifetime or maybe after you are dead. Now this question of theirs should not bother you at all. You keep on doing your work dedicatedly. Which work? The work of conveying. You will only be held responsible for your duty of conveying and nothing else. That's your job. And Allah says that bringing azab is my job. And we will bring it sooner or later when we feel that now the appropriate time has come. Verse 41, do they not see that we are gradually reducing the land in their control through reducing its borders. When Allah commands, there is none to reverse his command and he is swift in taking account. Now this verse has two meanings. One meaning is that can't the disbelievers see that their land is being sliced off? That is their sides uh, pass on under Muslim control and the the land occupied by them is reducing in size it, it's reducing in area this causes well-being for muslims and a day will come when the final phase of their victory shall stand completed and so it happened makkah was conquered and the whole area came under muslim control the second meaning given to this verse is as the Scientists say that the earth is contracting. 
Uh, in the beginning, the earth was many times bigger than the present size. Then it cooled and started contracting and thus started becoming smaller in size and then it became livable. Even now, the pressure on its core is increasing. You can divide the earth in three portions physically. The core, that is the innermost real uh, hot, red hot circle or the nucleus called the solid inner core then above it is the liquid outer core which we sometimes see as lava now after the core the second part is called the mantle and thirdly the crust the part on which we live the pressure on the inner core is increasing by the contraction of the earth and scientists say that when this pressure becomes unbearable one day then it is going to crack burst and blast and this is what the kayama will be a well-known uh, astronomist whose name was sir thames james from 1877 to 1946 he presented a theory that the earth was a part of the sun it was cut from the sun and started moving in the space on its own in the beginning its tem temperature was the same as the sun and how was it cut the theory says that a very huge star passed near the sun and its gravity pulled out this part away from the sun now this portion started moving in space and started to cool and after a long period it cooled to the point that its upper part became ready for life and it was then that human beings were sent. This is a theory and the reality, wallahu alam, only Allah knows best. This cooling and contraction of the earth has not finished that is why the verse says that we gradually we are gradually reducing the land in their control through reducing its borders the theories which we have about the earth one of them says that the size of the earth was a 10 times more than its present size and it took 5 billion years to come to its present size and it is still shrinking and the end of the verse says that the decision decision maker is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no one can give a second opinion on his decision meaning that time is moving near kayama and the time for hisab the time for accountability is near Verse 42, those unbelievers who have passed before them also devised plots, but Allah is the master of all plannings. He knows the actions of every soul. Soon the unbelievers will come to know who will get the home of paradise in the hereafter. Now the verse consoles Prophet wasallam that the non-believers had always been plotting and planning against the messengers of Allah. But it is Allah who is the master of all planning. Wallahu khairul makirin. Only Allah's plan prevails. Allah is well aware of everyone's intentions and deeds and the end will justify the means. The result of the akhirah will make clear what every soul was up to. And the lesson of the verse is that the home of the Akhirah is for those people who leave Makar, who do not plot and accept what is the truth. Verse 43, the unbelievers say, You are no Rasul. Say, Allah is all sufficient witness between me and you. And so are those who have knowledge of the book. The non-believers used to say to Prophet wasallam that you are not a Rasul of Allah. And he is made to say to them in this verse that I don't care what you think about me. I don't need your testimony to prove myself. Allah's testimony is enough for me. And also the testimony of the people of the book who had Iman who were not prejudiced, that as soon as they saw Prophet ﷺ, they recognized him and brought Iman 
and this includes Hazrat Abdullah bin Salam and Hazrat Salman Farsi رضي الله تعالى عنهم أجمعين. With that we end Surah Raat. وآخر الدوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين.